Read Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. Okay. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Okay, if you guys were listening, he just read the passage. The passage states, the word Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And then it says, king of Salem, Shalem, meaning peace. So you understand what he's doing here, right? So point being, his names are significant. So he's the king of peace. He's a king of righteousness. Now, the point Hebrews is making is that these names are deliberate. The story of Melchizedek is deliberately told in this way, meaning when the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write about Melchizedek, he was guided by the Spirit to write the story of Melchizedek in such a way as to leave the readers in suspense and to, to portray him, depict him as a mysterious figure because we don't know much about him. His story is found in Genesis 14, 18 to 20. You can read all the way to 22, Genesis 14, 18 to 22. And then he's mentioned only one other time, Psalm 110, verse 4. So if you want to open up, go to Genesis 14, 18 to 22. Genesis 14, 18 to 22. Then Melchizedek, king of Salong, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God. You catch high. what he did? Mm -hmm. He brings out bread and wine. He's a priest. He's a king. He's a priestly king, a royal priest, meaning... He offers sacrifices to God. He also blesses the people of God. So he's a priestly king, a royal priest. And notice what he does. He brings out bread and wine. You see how this is meant to be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ, our Lord, on the night of his betrayal, instituted the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And he brought out bread and wine and said, the bread is his body that is broken. And the wine, the cup, is his blood that is shed. So are you seeing how already in hindsight, in light of the New Testament revelation, Melchizedek is being depicted as a picture of a greater one. He's a shadow of the reality to come. So keep and, reading. And he blessed them and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now, now here you're not told who gave a tithe to who. He gave him a tithe of all. But it's implied that Abraham is giving Melchizedek a tithe because you give your tithes to God and by extension to the priest who stands in the place of God. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So you see. So who gave who a tenth, a tithe? Yeah, Abraham gave Melchizedek, who stands in the place of God, a tithe. Because the tenth is given to God, right? Exactly. But how does God receive the tenth? You give it to his priest. Exactly. So we know it's Abraham giving Melchizedek the tithe because he's giving it to God through the priest who represents God. Amen. And this Melchizedek is great. He not only blesses Abraham, he blesses God. Hmm. Bless both Abraham and God, right? Yes. And Abraham recognizes his status because Abraham allows him to bless him. Because Abraham's recognizing his God is my God. The God he worships is the God I worship, and he's the priest of my God because he doesn't extend that same honor to the king of Sodom. Right. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to Jehovah, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. So. Abraham does not do what the king of Sodom asks. He rejects him, whereas he honors Melchizedek by giving him a tithe, a tenth, and he allows Melchizedek to bless him in the name of God, possessor of heaven and earth, acknowledging that Melchizedek's God is his God. They worship the same God and that he's a priest of his God. So are we seeing all this? I guys want you to see this. If you guys are listening, already Melchizedek is someone astounding, someone 
mysterious, someone perplexing. Why? He shows up out of nowhere. Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And Abraham recognized Melchizedek is greater than him and a priest of the true God. Because Abraham would not allow Melchizedek to bless him if he wasn't a priest of the God of Abraham. And then moreover, Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. And Melchizedek means king of righteousness, king of Salem, king of peace. Uru Shalem, Shalem, Shalom, Shalem, right? Already we see something amazing, amazing, mysterious about Melchizedek. And the only other time he's mentioned is in Psalm 110, verse 4. Read that for me. Jehovah has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So notice, this is the second reference to Melchizedek. Not much is told about him. Why is he a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek? Melchizedek, ha Melchizedek has a priestly order? Why? Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and Abraham recognizes that Melchizedek, priest of the God that he worships. Why? We're not told. Does everyone see the pattern here? This Melchizedek is a mysterious, glorious, mind blowing figure because not only does he bless Abraham, the physical progenitor of the covenant people. So when a Jew sees that my ancestor, Gave a tithe to this Melchizedek, my ancestor, who is the friend of God, whom God made a covenant with. And through his seed, all nations will be blessed. Acknowledge the greatness of this priest by allowing him to bless him in recognition that his God is the God of my ancestor. And then Psalm 110 says that the anointed king will be a priest in his order, not from the Levitical order. Who is this Melchizedek? What's the answer? Why is he presented this way? Well, Hebrews comes and tells you why. Now we get the inspired explication, interpretation of why Melchizedek is portrayed as this glorious, mysterious being, majestic being. Understand how great he is. He's so great, he's greater than Abraham. He's so great, Abraham gives him a tenth in recognition that this is the priest of the God of Abraham and by extension, the God of Israel. He's so great that the anointed king will be a priest in his order. And that's all we're told of him. Genesis 14, 18, 20, Psalm 110, 4. Now comes the answer. If you don't believe the New Testament, then this is not going to make sense. The New Testament clearly teaches the entirety of the Old Testament, the entirety of the Hebrew Bible, designed, inspired by the Spirit, to point to the Lord Jesus Christ, his person and his work and his church as well as pointing to his coming in glory to establish God's kingdom on earth. But if you don't believe the New Testament and you reject the New Testament, then you're left with a mystery in Genesis and Psalm 110. Everyone with me there? We're with you. Without the New Testament, you can't answer these questions. That's why the Jews are perplexed. Do you understand? Let me go really deep into this topic. You understand that this perplexed the Jews? To such an extent that there is a scroll that was found. You guys have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls found 1947. They found a scroll from the 11th cave. These are in the Dead Sea area, in the Qumran caves. And in cave 11, they found a scroll talking about Melchizedek. It's called 11Q Melchizedek. Translated in English. And I wrote an article on it. And I also... Not only wrote an article on it, but I did a session on it. So I'm going to show you it in a minute. In this scroll, the Jews identify Melchizedek as the second divine power. There was a large segment of Jews before, during, even after the time of Christ that believed in two powers in heaven, two divine powers, Yahweh and a second power. That second power was variously called Son of Man, Angel of Yahuwah. And in this scroll, he's identified as Melchizedek. In this scroll, Psalm chapter 7, verses 7 to 8, is ascribed to Melchizedek. And Psalm 110 is ascribed to Melchizedek. And Isaiah 52, 7. Now, why is that astonishing? 
Psalm 7, 78, it's about Yahweh judging. And this scroll identifies Melchizedek as the Yahweh who comes to judge. Psalm 82 is a psalm about God judging the gods, the sons of God, and striking them dead. The scroll identifies Melchizedek as the God who strikes down those corrupt gods, those wicked sons of God, in judgment. And they identify the gods and the sons of God who this God strikes down as Belial and his angels, meaning Satan and his angels, and Melchizedek will strike him down, and his angels will strike down the angels of Belial, the king of evil. And on top of that, Melchizedek is said to come about and bring about the atonement for the people of God, because he's a priest. Now, where am I getting this all from? From that scroll, and let me screen share. The Dead Sea Scrolls and God's Uniplurality, some observations on Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. Here it is. I quote two English versions of the Melchizedek scroll. And you're going to see he's identified as Yahweh God of Psalm 778 right here. And he's identified as God of Psalm 82, verse 1, right here. And he's also considered, some say he's not the only anointed messenger, meaning the Messiah, but anointed messenger will announce the coming of Melchizedek as the God who reigns. So he's called the God your, the reigns. So Melchizedek said, your God reigns, right? They're right there. And he makes atonement. All this said about Melchizedek. Now, if people are understanding the point, and I go through this thoroughly and I break down implication. This means that there were Jews who believed Melchizedek was actually the second divine power who appeared as man on earth and went back to heaven. This is how confusing Melchizedek was to the Jews. Now, later rabbinic Judaism, later rabbinic Judaism, identified Melchizedek as who? Do you know? No, I don't know. Shem, the son of Noah. Oh, really? Yep. Later rabbinic Judaism said this was Shem, the son of Noah, who was still alive when Abraham was alive. And that's why Abraham acknowledged him, because it was Shem. But the Jews who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls says, no, he's a divine being. He's Elohim, identified with God, who appears as a man and goes back and will come again to then destroy Bel Belial and his angels and to make atonement for the people of God. What does this mean? It means the Jews were baffled by Genesis 14, 18 to 20, and baffled by Psalm 110, verse 4. They didn't know what to make of Melchizedek. But because we believe Jesus Christ, our Lord, is God, who died and rose again, who lives, and he poured out the Holy Spirit on his apostles and their companions, and the Spirit moved them to write the New Testament, to accurately interpret the Old Testament, we now get the answer. Now we're going to go back to Hebrews 7. Yep, read verses 1 to 3. Okay. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the king's and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, here's the article I wrote on the meaning of Hebrews 7.3. Here it is. How do I know Melchizedek is not Jesus, contrary to what people say? Because, guys, please don't be stubborn. Don't add to Scripture. Here's how I know. The word, but resembling Son of God, the word resembling, aphomoi ominos, okay, comes from aphomoi o, resembling, made to look like, a copy of. If you go to your Greek lexicon, and if you like Strong's, the strong will tell you that this word, afamoyo, means to cause a model to pass off into an image or shape like it, to express itself in it, to copy, to produce a facsimile, to be made like, render similar. The word shows that Melchizedek cannot be the Son of God because he's made like the Son of God. He's made a copy of the Son of God. He's a facsimile of the Son of God. That means he's not the Son of God, right? Correct. So that's why Jesus is the prototype with Melchizedek being the type. 
That's how I know he's not the son because he's resembling the son. He's a facsimile of the son. He's a type of the son. The son is the prototype. Melchizedek is the shadow and Christ is the reality. Okay, now to further prove Melchizedek is not Jesus in his preeminent existence, read Hebrews 7, 15. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. So who is the one who comes in the likeness of Melchizedek? The Messiah. Jesus. Because it tells you in verse 14 that our Lord came from Judah, a right. tribe which Moses said nothing about priests, right? Right. So in Hebrews 7, 15, Jesus is what? Read it again. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. So if Christ is in the likeness of Melchizedek, he's another priest. That means he's not Melchizedek, the priest. Exactly. Okay, but here's the issue now. What's the issue? We only know that we, we know there's only one high priest in heaven, Jesus. Read the book of Hebrews. Read Hebrews 4 from 14 to 16. Read Hebrews 9. Read from 12 to 28. Read Hebrews 7 all the way to the end. You'll see that it is Christ and Christ alone who entered the most holy place before the Father's presence as the high priest, and he sits at the right side of the throne. There is no other high priest. There's only one. Only Christ is high priest in heaven. Only Christ entered the most holy place of heaven. Only Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, next to the Father, beholding the Father's face, presenting his blood before the Father's presence. He alone is there as high priest. That right there tells you that the author of Hebrews does not mean what he says literally. You understand? Right. If you read Hebrews in context, he shows you Melchizedek is not literally a high priest who is still serving because where is he serving? At the time of the writing, the temple was there and it was a Levitical priest serving in the temple in Jerusalem. No Melchizedek. And he just told you that in heaven, Jesus is the high priest. He's the one who's gone behind the veil, who's sitting on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, next to the Father as our high priest, not Melchizedek. Does everyone get it? Yes. So that means if Hebrew shows you Melchizedek is not there in heaven with Jesus, and he's not on earth in Jerusalem, because at that time it's the Levitical priesthood, they're the ones serving temple in Jerusalem, then he expects you to understand he's not speaking literally. In other words, he's trusting that you guys know how to read and read contextually and read accurately that you'll know this is not literal. Because if he meant it literally, that means he'd show somewhere in his book that there are two high priests in heaven, Melchizedek and Jesus. But there's only one, and it's Jesus. Okay, did everyone get it? If we got it, now I can unpack his point. His point is... There's nothing in Scripture that wasn't deliberately placed there by design. The Spirit deliberately moved Moses and David to describe Melchizedek in such a way as leaving us with the impression that he's not merely human. Because number one, we're not told that he was born. We're not told that he died. We're not told his race. We're not told his ethnicity. We're not told of his parentage. All left out. And then in Psalm 110.4, we're told there's a priesthood in his order, in his line. Why? These details were left out in order to present Melchizedek as an eternal divine person appearing as a man, having no beginning and no end because he's uncreated and he never dies. In order to point to the one who really is all those things. In other words, the point of Hebrews 7.3 is to show Jesus is really, in reality, what Melchizedek is simply a shadow of. It is the son who's uncreated, beginningless, 
whose years never die. And as God, he has no human progenitors and remains forever a priest. That's the point of Hebrews 7.3. Amen. Amen. In other words, it's one of the strongest proof texts that Christ is beginningless, uncreated. His years never end, which is exactly what he said in Hebrews 1, 8 to 12 about Jesus. So go to Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. But to the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in so the now, beginning. Don't forget, emphasize, it's the Father speaking to the Son about the Son. And now notice the Father says to the Son in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, what? He says to the Son, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. So the Father says to Jesus, you're the Lord. You laid the foundation of the earth. You made the heavens by your own hands, which is a metaphor by your own power. And what else? They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. Okay, did everyone see? Jesus literally has no beginning because he was there before creation. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything in creation. He's the one who's sustaining creation, preserving creation, changing creation. And like creation, he doesn't change, remains the same. Exactly. So he's already told you in Hebrews 1, Jesus is uncreated. Jesus is beginningless. Jesus brought the entire creation to being, sustains it by his powerful word. That's Hebrews 1, 3 changes it transforms it and yet he remains the same years never end so what is said about melchizedek is true of christ melchizedek is presented as if he's eternal but in reality he's presented that way because he's a picture of the one who is eternal that's all and even in the worst case scenario let's say oh no melchizedek is literally eternal and created then all you prove is that's the holy spirit what do i mean even at worst, even if you don't accept my expectation uh, explanation, this doesn't mean there's a fourth person in the Godhead because this would mean that Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit because there are three uncreated persons in the Godhead. Mm -hmm. So since Melchizedek is not the Father, he's not the Son, that means you're left with the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who appeared as a man who resembles the Son because the Son and the Spirit are inseparable and they mimic one another's functions and deeds so at worst case you're only proving it's holy spirit so either way you don't get a fourth person in the godhead and by the way do people want me to prove that the holy spirit though not the son and separate from the son and mimics and does the deeds and the functions the son carries out you guys want me to show you that well i know i do it looks like people are saying yes right away. So, okay. How many intercessors we have? We have two. Go to Romans 8 34. Watch. Let me show you. Who, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Okay. So, who makes intercession for us? The Son. The Son, right? But now read Romans 8, 26 to 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. Now notice, like Jesus, the Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit intercedes for us and through us. But now notice the other connection. So they're both intercessors. One physically in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and one with us, interceding for us and through us. But mm -hmm. now watch the other proof, that Jesus and the Spirit, though not the same person, 
distinct and inseparable, carry out the same functions and perform the same deeds. Not always, because the spirit did not become flesh, but in these aspects. Here, John 14, 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, notice, before you move on, his translation says helper. That's okay. It can be translated helper, advocate, comforter, counselor. The key verse is another. The word another in Greek is alos. It's the accusative of alos, alon. Alon means another of the same kind. Another of the same kind. So if you read your Greek here, John 14, 16, it's alon, perikliton. Another paraclete. Perikletos. Perikliton. Paraclete can be rendered helper, comforter, counselor, advocate. And it's another of the same kind. Alon, accusative of alos. The other word, homos, means another of the same kind, right? But then you have another word, heteros, another of a different kind. Homos, same. Alos, same. Heteros, different. And you'll see it in English, heterosexual, a different kind of sex. Homosexual, the same kind of sex. So here, when John writes in Greek, he doesn't say heteron perikliton, a different kind of paraclete. He says alon, alos, another of the same kind. Okay? Amen. So this paraclete is the same kind of paraclete as the other because another means there's someone else besides him. Another means the Holy Spirit is not the only helper. There's another helper who is as the spirit because this spirit is the same kind of helper as the other one. So there are at least two, right? Correct. Okay, now the question is, who is the other paraclete, paracletos, the other helper, counselor, the other advocate? Because Jesus says the Holy Spirit is another paraclete, meaning there's at least one other paraclete. And these two paracletes, are of the same kind. They're not the same person. That's why he's another, but they're the same kind. You don't need to guess. John who wrote the Gospel of John wrote 1 John 2, 1. Now you read it in your translation, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an helper with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Wait. Helper with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Helper with the Father. That's the word parakletos. It's an accuser, parakleton. John 14, 16. I will pray the Father give you another helper. Notice, we have an advocate. It's the same Greek word. Hmm. Jesus is the parakletos with the Father, who at one time was with believers on earth, and the Holy Spirit is the other Paracletos, who's now with the church. So do you catch it? Like Jesus, the Holy Spirit intercedes. Like Jesus, he guides, instructs, and teaches the church. Like Jesus, he is a helper, an advocate. Therefore, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, though this thing, perform the same functions. Right? So all you're proving is that Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit. That's it.